Nadia Bilchik is a television news anchor, keynote speaker, author, trainer, and communications consultant. She has a wealth of experience interviewing and consulting with well-renowned figures, celebrities, and corporations. Nadia Bilchik. And it's not very often that I get to speak to a Viscountess. Yes, today it's all about Queen Elizabeth II. And I'm delighted to be joined by a royal expert, part of nobility herself, Julie. We can say that, right? You married into a noble family. So you are actually Viscountess Julie Montague. And you are the daughter-in-law of the third Earl of Sandwich. So, first of all, before we start talking about the Queen, tell us about you and how an American woman married into a family of British noble blood. Well, it's a question I do get asked quite frequently because, to be honest, there's not very many uh, Viscountesses around that are American these days. In fact, I might be one of the only ones uh, in the British uh, nobility. But, you know, I met my husband, Nadia, when I hadn't a single clue about the nobility and this aristocracy and these families that existed. You know, my my recollection of uh, when I when I met my husband was that he was just a normal person like you and me, you know, with a with a name, Luke Montague. And it wasn't until three months into our relationship that he actually paid for something. And his credit card said Viscount Hinchingbrook. <laughs> and and for, for me, I, first of all, I didn't even know what a Viscount was. So let's just put that out there. I had absolutely no idea. So I actually thought it was like a company name <laughs> so, um, that it was, you know, really a company name. And then he had to explain to me his family's illustrious past. And in particular, of course, that he would one day be the Earl of Sandwich. And of course, that opened up a whole range of other questions saying, you know, the sandwich as in the sandwich that we eat today. And he said, yes, um, my ancestor uh, in one sense, invented the sandwich. The for, fourth Earl of Sandwich was really the, the the phrase sandwich or the word sandwich, I should say, was coined after the fourth Earl of Sandwich. So it was, I had to get my head around this whole new history and family that I was marrying, marrying into. And I have loved watching your YouTube on looking at historical places in England and even times where you actually are with the Earl of Sandwich. So just special. And if people want more of that, you can look up Julie at juliemontague.com. There's lots about British royalty and British nobility and beautiful homes that I know you've had a big part in restoring. But Getting to the Queen, since Thursday of last week, you have been very busy talking about the Queen. And what I wanted to share today was, yes, the Queen is by no means perfect, nor is the monarchy perfect. But as a professional speaker who does a lot of work around leadership development, I wanted to talk about what we can learn from the Queen. So you have been talking about this, but let's look at what's positive and why we look at the queen as an exemplary leader. Well, it's, I mean, this is wonderful to be talking about this and in particular, of course, focusing on the queen and why she was such a good leader. One of the things that really stands out for me and I think for many people is that the queen was able to keep the monarchy intact throughout these 70 years, despite the British empire shrinking, despite her children and grandchildren being splashed across the front pages due to scandal and gossip. But, you know, if polls are to be believed, the majority of Brits still believe that the country should keep its monarchy. And because of this affection for the queen, she was always able to rise above. She never, let and, let's, and I think this is a big point, Nadia, she never reacted. And sometimes I think that in the world of, if, of that we're living in right now with social media and so many opinions, reactions can really cause divisions. And for the queen, she was able to humbly put out these statements, whether that was about Harry and Meghan brexiting and you know the, the role that they wanted to take, sort of a half in, half out role within the monarchy, 
um, she was able in one sense to kindly say, unfortunately, that's not going to happen. You're either in or you're out. Or even around, we know with the Oprah uh, Winfrey interview, you know, that was quite a shock for the royal family. And there were a lot of allegations made there. And instead of reacting to it and causing more division, the queen simply put out, we love Harry and Meghan, recollections may vary, but we will always support them. And for me, you know, it's that lo lovely Michelle Obama statement, when they go low, we go high. And the queen has always done that. So looking at that moment and wondering, I mean, do you have any inside information about how she really felt? Because one thing that commentators have been saying over the last week is you never really knew how she felt. So I wonder, is there conversation amongst the inner circles about how did she really feel? What do you think? Julie, the what, queen, what you really the think queen. About when Harry and Meghan went to live in Santa Barbara? The queen, as you know, and as you just um, so beautifully put, holds her cards close to her. But we do know from statements time and time again that the queen is about duty. And so duty will always trump anything else. And it will trump, in one sense, family. Uh, we can look at Prince Andrew, for an example. He was stripped of, yeah. you know, he, uh, he was stripped of being a senior working royal. And so it's for the queen, it's if, if you do not set the right example in Prince Andrew's case, or you want to try to negotiate your role, no, you know, duty is, and she's been able to run this institution and run this machine for 70 years throughout these scandals and still become and, and be and was this the most popular monarch we have ever seen. Her ratings in the polls are well and above 90%. So no matter what her grandchildren and children did, remember three of her uh, four children are divorced. There are a lot of scandal. We know what's happened with Harry and Meghan. She still was able to maintain this huge popularity, not just across the UK, but around the world. And I think it's because she doesn't react. She doesn't go into yeah. the, the fighting and the opinions and she puts out a statement and then it's done with. So what did people in royal inner circles feel? Or is there something people don't discuss? I mean, we are living in America. I am South African living in America and South Africans are very interested in the queen. Not saying all, oh, please. We have to be very politically correct when we yes. discuss them because there is controversy and yeah. well founded. But we're talking about the positive aspects. What can we learn from her? And I'm just curious, as somebody who is living in England, when the Harry Meghan situation arose, how did you feel about it? What did your family think? There was sadness all around the UK. Absolutely. Uh, including myself um, and, and including many other families mm -hmm. of nobility, including the British public. Because let's remember, we, uh, Harry was, you know, I don't want to say the favorite, but out of Princess Diana's children, he was considered the cheeky one. He would get out of line um, and he was in one sense thought of as most like his mother, breaking the rules, asking the questions, going out on his own. And people really loved that and respected that. And I think for everybody, when Harry and Meghan decided to leave and start their you know, own life overseas, it was a sadness because of also the love for the people's princess, Princess Diana, and the connection that we have seen throughout these years prior to Harry and Meghan leaving, the connection and the bond between William and Harry. And it was a real sadness. And of course, there were many people who thought, oh, this American has come in just like Wallace Simpson. You know, Wallace Simpson came in and caused, in one sense, you know, uh, the King Edward VIII, Prince of Wales, but King Edward VIII to abdicate. Therefore, we were able to have uh, uh, Queen Elizabeth's father, uh, King George VI. But, you know, this American divorcee causing problems, he's abdicated. And now look at, 
obviously Harry didn't abdicate, but some people deemed it as an abdication in itself. He's leaving the country to uh, set up shop, you know, in America. And, and the Brits were absolutely, they were hurt by that, definitely hurt by that. But it's interesting that we're looking at life and leadership lessons and the Queen, while maybe deeply disappointed, still put on a facade of saying he is my grandchild, I will support him and took the high road. So that really is an important lesson. The other lesson that I think is an interesting one is that she does and did apologize. So going back to Princess Diana's death in 1997, and I remember it so well because, Julie, that is the year we moved from Johannesburg, South Africa to Atlanta, Georgia, and I was having a birthday party, and I think everybody remembers where they were when they heard about Princess Diana. And it's hard to believe that that is, what, 26 years ago? 25 years ago. Oh my, Harry and Meghan, or Harry, sorry, Harry and, and William, just walking behind the queen's coffin almost 25 years to the date that they walked behind their mothers their mothers was september oh, 6 1997 right 1997 so the queen was criticized for how she handled the announcement so tell us more about that and then also how she gracefully and graciously apologized which i think is another important life lesson of course it's a life lesson and that that is what the queen you know she is such dignity you know, dignity and honor, but also able to able to say in her own words, right, making what was perceived as a wrong a right in the eye of the public. Now mm -hmm. we know that she was there at Balmoral trying to protect the boys. They were 12 and 15, they had just lost their mother. And this had never, you know, I, I think let's remember you know, when you when you look at these situations, you're thinking family first. How am I going? Family is going to come first. And but yet there was this outcry and outpouring of love and support for Princess Diana that nobody really expected on the scale that we saw it. And the queen was able, to, I do believe, quickly to realize that, right, I am now being, you know, I'm I'm splashed across the front pages of, of the British newspapers in a negative way and how she redeemed herself. And this is what's extraordinary about the queen is when the coffin of Princess Diana passed, the queen bowed her head. And oh, for the queen I, 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 to I, bow. You right. get very tearful because that's, you know, she said, and, and what was her line? She said she was a very talented and gifted person about Diana. And she gave her a state funeral. Yes. yes. So yes, the, the queen has a way of making things right because let's remember, she's about service to the people. So on the one hand, she came in, she protected her grandsons at the very beginning, but then she also quickly realized, I have a service to the people. And Diana was so well loved. She was the people's princess, state funeral, but no one told the queen to bow to Diana. Nobody, you know, only others, uh, others like us bow to the queen. The queen does not bow to anybody else. And here she did. And she bowed to Princess Diana's coffin. And that was such an important moment in bringing the country together and she understood the power that that had on the reputation of the monarchy because that's something else people have been saying julie she understood that the world had changed i mean even her tea with paddington bear and the things she did when the um olympic games came to london so talk about that and just the ability to adapt, because I keep going, you know, we're obsessed with the pump and the ceremony and it's very beautiful, but what are we learning from this? Right, and that's a fair point, Nadia. And we can see that the queen has absolutely, you know, she evolved over these 70 years. She sent out her first tweet in 2014 and signed it Elizabeth R. As you said before, she participated, uh, you know, a huge 
um, stunt, if you like. I mean, obviously they had a stunt doubles, but with James Bond, uh, Daniel Craig for the 2012 London Olympics and her three corgis as well. So she's always been able to evolve with the times. Let's remember, she started to give her Christmas address every year and was able to broadcast that. She looked to TV in order to help to, and radio, in order to help to modernize the royal family. And that's what she did. Looking at the pandemic, you know, and I don't know how much this was reported um, other than in the UK, but, you know, she, she, of course, broadcast a message for all of us who were locked up in our homes saying, we will meet again. You will meet your loved ones again. And beautiful, right? We will meet again, which was echoing of the Second World War and so many different things. So I love that we will meet again. Yes. So in terms of you as somebody who is not observing it, I say we're, we're observing it really from a distance. I think you're observing it closer. Your father-in-law, who's the third Earl of Sandwich, did he ever meet the queen? Did he ever get to know her? What does his generation feel about the queen? Yeah, so I am going to say, Nadia, um, my father-in-law is the 11th Earl of Sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> That's how far back we go. Okay, to, the uh, 11th Earl of Sandwich. That's even more remarkable. Yeah, so he. What, what's rather extraordinary about this is that the reason that the family I married into, the Montesquieu family, was uh, given this title, the Earl of Sandwich, is because the last time we had a King Charles was King Charles II. So King Charles II was brought back from exile by the first Earl of Sandwich before he was before he was given that um, her, that that peerage. We, we call it a peerage over here. The Earl of Sandwich. He was Edward Montagu. He was head of the Admiralty. Um, and he was able to take his ship over to Holland, bring Charles II back for the restoration. So remember, prior to that, King Charles I was executed. We, you know, it was the first time we didn't have a monarchy um, over that period of time. And then there was this secret mission to bring Charles II back and to reinstate the monarchy. And that is why our family was given um, uh, given this title and, and Sandwich was a great naval port. So it's in Kent. If people ask what it, why Sandwich, it's, it was a great naval port at that time. So of course he would choose that, uh, that name, that, um, that title, I should say, Earl of Sandwich. And how extraordinary is now we have the king, uh, the new king, which is Charles III. But so our, you know, we are one of the oldest, uh, families of nobility in this country that's how far back we go and for me it's my father-in-law is still one of the 92 peers who were um uh voted in to stay in the 90s he's in the house of lords and it's i think you know for that generation they have seen so much themselves but of course as we know the only queen that you know, most people in the UK have known, or the only monarch that most people in the UK have known has been the queen herself. So we're moving on to this, a new, a new uh, period that many people have never seen before. But for me, it's quite extraordinary as the American, I come in on one side, Nadia, as being fascinated by the royal family, like so many Americans. And yet I've married into this, you know, most okay. noble family. And, and I've had to really, to be honest, sort of up my learning curve um, and up the game of, of learning about British history and in particular, the monarchy. And your father-in-law, the 11th Earl of Sandwich, when he got the news that Queen Elizabeth II had died, did you speak to him? What was his response? Absolutely. Well, what we did, we have a, a, a family estate, uh, it's in Dorset, um, it's a historic house that is, of course, nowadays open to the public. People can come in. We have thousands of visitors. With your own Fountain Abbey, Julie. Yeah. <laughs> With what? Come visit. Come and visit. Tell me come so that if people are, where, so where do they find out more? What's the website? So they can just go to Mapperton, M-A-P-P-E-R-T-O-N.com. We are, we luckily have sort of the accolade of the nation's finest manor house 
It's a Tudor manor house. So it was first built in the 1540s and it's an extraordinary house and it has the Montague slash sandwich collection inside the house. You can have house tours. You can go visit our garden. But you live there as well. Yes, we live there as well. I mean, it's, it's you yeah. know, for us, so this is magical. I, I've looked at your website and I see American Viscountess and it's very romantic. It is, it, it is, it is. On the one hand, Nadia, you, you know, some people say, oh, you're living the fairy tale. But of course, times have changed. And, you know, the aristocrats, you know, we, we can't just live like they did in Downton Abbey. In fact, nobody does. Uh, time correct. You know, when you watch Downton Abbey, and remember, I am South African. I grew up in apartheid South Africa. People still live, Julie, in South Africa with help. I'm glad to say apartheid was dismantled, is no longer, but there is still an element of, of servitude. I mean, when people, my friends, go back to South Africa and see the servant uh, relationship or the help we now, it's domestic assistance, yes. it's changed, but it is something for Americans, it's an enigma. It's something, yeah. but for you, I mean, do you live in a home with domestic no. assistance? Do you have a butler? No, I, I, no. Oh my, do we have a butler? No, absolutely well, not. Definitely has a lot and had a lot and Charles will have a lot of, course. of people because that's part of what it is, right? Now, I heard that William and Kate um, had moved into something smaller so they could have a more normal life and be close to the Queen. And now, of course, they're moving. How much is their life going to change? Well, the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge, and now I'll call them the Prince and Princess of Wales, I think their, their life is going to change quite significantly because they, we will see them much more um, on these royal engagements, uh, elevating um, charities that they um, feel need to be elevated and their platform can help with that. We know that Prince Charles is, well, sorry, we know that King Charles III is, King Charles III is 73 years old. He's had 73 years to prepare for this. He will be, in one sense, in my view, acting as an extension um, for his mother's legacy and to the, that older generation. But I think many people believe that for this monarchy to survive, it needs to definitely involve much more the Prince and Princess of Wales. And we've seen that over the past year after the Queen with mobility issues started to give up a lot of her responsibilities to King Charles, now King Charles III, as well as the new Prince and Princess of Wales, we started to see, you know, Charles and William doing more things together, Charles, Camilla, William and Catherine doing more things together. And I, I you know, I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure I'm gonna be right on this. We're gonna see a lot more of the four of them doing things together because you'll have this bridge in order to uh, make sure that the monarchy survives by bridging the older generation with the younger generation. The monarchy needs the younger generation. Absolutely. And, and have really good public relations people. I mean, clearly there's a team orchestrating things. So when you look, so a couple of things I want to unpack here. Number one, and when I was at CNN, I did a segment and I'm hoping my producer, when he edits this, so you're not gonna see the live version, shows the piece around why the queen didn't abdicate. Because people kept saying, why didn't she abdicate? And I'm going to show you the CNN segment on that. So. This weekend, Queen Elizabeth became so ill that she had to cancel her appearance at a military ceremony in Wales. The Queen is 86 years old now. Some people have wondered if she'll ever give up the throne, perhaps. But she's renowned for her stamina, her fortitude, and for honoring her commitment. So canceling an appearance is pretty unusual for her. And this has some people wondering certainly how she's doing. Uh, and with us to talk about that is Nadia Bilchik, our editorial producer. So what exactly is wrong with the queen? Do we well, know? The queen has gastroenteritis, which in and of itself is not what is, serious. What does that mean that exactly? That means in essence she has the trot. So she is uh, not going to be going out. <laughs> it happens out. even to royalty. <laughs> exactly, okay. as okay. you said. Got it. But the reality is for her to cancel, 
a commitment is very unusual and she yeah. knows how much trouble these people go to and especially at such short notice but we understand she's not desperately ill but she is uncomfortable okay so so it is a bit of a big deal it's unusual she's in her 80s 86, 86 now she's about the same age actually as the pope that just abdicated but do you think we would ever see her step down never you will never see queen elizabeth abdicate or step down. In fact, the very word is taboo in the palace. Now, you have to remember that Queen Elizabeth was 10 years old when her uncle, Edward VIII, did abdicate. He was the first British monarch to abdicate in over a thousand years. And for her, it was shocking. And for the entire palace at the time, it was traumatic. It was a horrible abdication. It caused enormous rifts in the monarchy and that's how her father George became king but she remembers the trauma well and the dishonor it brought on the family but what if and I, th I actually thought that was covered pretty interestingly in the King's speech which some people may be familiar with you kind of got the sense of just how uh, horrific it would have been from her perspective but what happens if she does become really ill or she's incapacitated right, so if she is incapacitated what happens then is she appoints a regent so one assumes Charles would become regent but she would still retain the title of the Queen when she had her coronation in 1953 then she took an oath under God to reign England and the Commonwealth countries. And for her, that is absolutely sacred duty above all else. She takes it very seriously. But what about, um, you know, in Holland recently, Queen Beatrice, she recently abdicated. So did her mother. Why, why can they get away with it? Let's different say. rules. It's different. In the Netherlands, different the idea culture of a monarch, different culture, different customs, different rules. In the Netherlands, the idea is you are not monarch for life. But for Queen Elizabeth, she is the monarch, the sovereign for life. And eventually, one assumes Charles will then become king, and after that, William. And then, of course, Kate and William being pregnant right now, whether they have a son or daughter will become the next monarch. And what's happening as we speak is the 16 Commonwealth countries are going to approve the fact that it may be a daughter becoming the next monarch. Oh, interesting, very interesting. But it sounds like even if, for instance, she were to get even farther up in years and it would all become too much for her that she remains the monarch, she, Charles effect, effectively takes over. She but may she's still delegate the some of her yes. duties, which she has already done, yes. but you will see Queen Elizabeth as queen till the day she dies. All right, Nadia Bilchik, thank you very much for that. Right now, you've got a situation where there must be smart, smart people who are saying, and of course, it's Princess Catherine, you've said it correctly. We refer to them as William and Kate, but you yeah. are experts, so we knew. But they say to her, Kate isn't as queenly as Catherine or as Princess like. So, all of these little nuances, this is a business, this is branding. And Smart people are saying this is what you should do on a very deeply personal level. Julie, how do you think it impacts somebody like Princess Catherine Kate? Do you think she's delighted, excited, or do you think it is huge amounts of pressure or both? She's absolutely ready for this role. You know, as, as Prince William said in his statement to the Queen, uh, you've been able uh, to get to know my, uh, been there for my wife for 20 years, been able, you know, so we know this relationship with William and Catherine, you know, it's been longer than, of course, the, their marriage together. They've been together for 20 years. The queen knew Catherine for 20 years. She has been absolutely primed for this. And they will have, of course, their PR team around them. We have seen, though, recently, Nadia, you know, when they went on their Caribbean tour um, in order to uh, to represent the Queen for the Platinum Jubilee, there were a few missteps there. There were absolutely a few missteps, some not very uh, flattering photos uh, that came out. But immediately, as they were flying back... One, a not particularly flattering because I want to talk about that which an example of so you know we we saw and it was really unfortunate but they were at an event and uh children at a nearby school ran through uh ran to greet them but there was a fence separating them and their hands went through and, you know, it just... The visual of children's the hands visual. through a fence, got it. Yes. Because um, one thing my mother always used to say, you know, 
the queen never gets photographed while she's eating, darling. Because, you know, you'll be at a table and people will be taking snapshots. And my mother always would go, you must never get photographed while eating. The queen never does. You know, just something as simple as that. If you look at those royal portraits, they're always so beautifully orchestrated. Um, but just, it is unflattering to be chewing while you're getting a picture taken. Right. And it's certainly, uh, you know, not uh, a very good uh, a photo when you're seeing, you know, that that photo of, of uh, yeah. school children okay. through the fence. Yeah. And, I mean, so basically everything, being aware that everything is being scrutinized. Even everything. that walkabout, the famous walkabout last week where you had Catherine and William, Princess Catherine and Prince William, Julie, we need to get it right. Yeah. <laughs> and then you had Meghan and Harry. Yeah. I mean, just the four of them together. I think people just read a sigh of relief. Whether you care deeply or don't care, there's something about a family coming together. So I think That's this right. is a reality show out there right now, if we're really trying to understand people's obsession with it. Of course. And and that's what it is. And, it, you know, we only get very, very small snippets. Who knows what's gone on behind yeah. closed doors yeah. or behind those palace doors. But we we also know that, you know, all uh, networks and royal commentators were told that it was uh, going to be just the prince and princess of Wales who would be greeting the public at uh, on the long walk at Windsor. We were not told that the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, Meghan and Harry would also be arriving with them. And the reason we weren't told that is because it's now been reported that an hour before that uh, meet and greet, if you like, to the public, the Prince and Princess of Wales extended an offer to the Duke and Duchess of Sussex and asked them if they would like to come with them to greet the public. And they said, yes. So this was oh, very yes. last oh, minute. It's so not a grant. Exactly. And, you know, again, I'm trying to understand why we're so unbelievably riveted by all of this. And even people who maybe are not royalists as such just still find the, the, the human aspect just completely fascinating. And then the fact that you've got, you know, this American actress and, you know, so many people, it's fascinating though, the kind of comments people make around, you know, how she got her claws into him. I mean, he is a man, he did have a say in it. Now, just on another note, so we look at the interview, the famous Harry Meghan interview, correct titles, thank you for providing, which was so controversial. And going back to one of my mantras in the world of personal branding is everything you do and say communicates, everything. Was that a smart thing to do? Was it a stupid thing to do? Well, I think it will be something that many people, including the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, might look back uh, with um, I might look back on with regret throwing your family under a bus on a global scale because you are angry or you're bitter and that let's be honest that is what's come out of that I'm mm -hmm. not I'm not here to disprove or or prove the facts or the you know what is right what what is uh, sort of uh, in a gray uh, area but I do believe that time heals. And a lot of times if we don't as families or even in a friendship, if we don't give it the time to heal, we may regret saying things. And in particular, in their case, they said things on a global scale because fast forward to where we are now, and we saw the four of them walking together. And I suspect there will be some, some thinking, Nadia, around whether or not Prince Harry's memoir should be coming out at the end of the year. Because if you saw that scene mm -hmm. at Windsor Castle, and then three months from now, around Christmas, we're all you know told to buy or you know, Prince Harry comes out with his book and it's another scathing, uh, scathing well, book. About the royals, things, About yes. the royals. I think people will be really aggrieved by that because they will say, 
why would you do this mm-hmm. when the queen has just died? Your brother's given you the olive branch. Yeah, you know, what, what is the point of this? And then, then there will be real questions, Nadia, of the intention around that book. What is the intention then? Yeah. Is the intention to make money? And I think those are, qu- those are relevant questions to ask right now if the and, book comes out. The institution, I think that's what's come out, this remarkable institution of this, the, the pomp, the ceremony, but really, as you said, the queen, just the enormous dignity, the lessons learned, the remarkable legacy that she leaves and just structure, having structure, having, I mean, so much part of British culture, just having things that keep us unified. So that's just so many things that have have come out of this really. What was very interesting is I was watching um, a piece of of the young new prime minister, Liz Mm -hmm. Truss, and she was, she must have been 20 at the time and she's doing this very vociferous speech about how antiquated the royals are and how there's no place for monarchy in England juxtapose that with who she is now. I don't know. I mean, that's also interesting. Another another twist. Well, it is another twist. And I think, you know, I'm not going to comment too much about the new prime minister, but I will say if you do look very closely at her past, you know, she has um, been known to sort of switch sides. So she, remember, she was a Remainer and then is now supporting well, we've already Brexited and is now supporting sort of the Brexit process. So, uh, you know, I I think sometimes people in politics, and I'll just use this as a broad term, you know, in order to survive and be reelected and get high approval ratings, they can flip flop. And that's the one thing that the queen never did. Ah, and that's nice. what makes her extraordinary. You know, she, she never, she never, um, what's another nice word for it? She never flipped up. She never wavered. No, she never I mean, wavered. You know, that's and, quite an interesting quality, although she never wavered, but there was no rigidity with that. And I always think about that moment when Michelle Obama sort of puts her arm out to her, which is such a, a violation of protocol, right? And instead of her recoiling, she simply does it back. I mean, that's very gracious. That's a high level of emotional intelligence. It is. And she was always gracious to people. And again, we can just go back to Princess Diana's, uh, you you know, um, death. And when the queen went to go visit all of the flowers and the notes and she was speaking to the public there. That is what's extraordinary about the queen. The queen never, and I do believe this, the queen, and, and same with King Charles III, they never really looked at polls. You know, King Charles III, you know, hasn't changed his views on climate change or the environment. And he, you know, was in one sense, you know, when he, when he was, that was, it still is his sort of main passion and something that he speaks about it with a lot of strength and, and passion around it. He hasn't changed his tune around that in order for people to like him or to be higher up in the polls. And that's the same thing with Queen. And I think it's, you know, when we look back at the Queen and leadership, it's sticking with your gut and Mm. and talking about the things that you believe in and not doing this in one sense, oh, I've got to sort of shift what I uh, believe in or the platform I want to use or in order for people to like me. And we never saw the queen do this. Strong sense of value, strong, strong sense of honor. Now, you bring up the point about Charles and climate change. So the other thing is she was very non-committal and apolitical. Um, he is said to have often written to government and, and have very, very strong points of view. Are we going to see less of his strong points of view if he's to emulate her, her apolitical nature? Of course. And, you know, climate change in the environment is such a hot topic right now. And when we look at the past 70 years of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, you know, her purpose was served in unifying and healing 
a, a broken nation or and really that's saying it through times of, of war, through times of a pandemic, through times of, of political division. But perhaps a monarchy these days, Nadia, with a meaningful purpose like climate change, like the environment, is what it needs in order to stay relevant and to survive? It's a big question. So it's interesting because CNN, um, Smakanish, one of the shows, did a poll recently and they said, what's going to survive longer, the British monarchy or American democracy? Well, it was a bit of a horrifying result, but they said that they thought uh, the British monarchy had a better chance. So as we wrap up, and I know it's been just such a wonderful opportunity to talk to you because, yes, I've seen snippets of you, but really having this conversation what do you see happening? And we know the funeral of the Queen is on Monday the 19th, but what do you see playing out with King Charles? What are your thoughts, ideas, and hopes? And I think that's the million dollar question, Nadia, is what happens next? What do we hope for? I think, you know, right now, King Charles III is being incredibly well received jubilant crowds we saw on uh earlier this week you know when the proclamations that, uh, were made the seals were stamped the witness signatures we saw that entire day happen for the first time ever um live and uh, so that everybody across the world could witness this but are we in a honeymoon period you know remember the the british press can be brutal they can turn on you any time and just look at Meghan Markle. You know, the wedding, her wedding to Prince Harry was a huge success for the most part. But quickly thereafter, the honeymoon was over and so were the positive headlines. And, you know, I think it's too early to say right now it we're mourning the Queen. We're, uh, you, you have this public all around the world in mourning and and yet at the same time in celebration of her 70 years where she was able to keep calm and carry on and that's and the truth keep calm and exactly. carry on and i have this quote behind me that i wanted to to share she says i know of no single formula for success but over the years i have observed that some of the attributes of leadership are universal and are often about finding ways of encouraging people to combine their efforts their talents their insights their enthusiasm and their inspiration to work together i mean just such a lovely quote from her in terms of working together and I, another quote that i really appreciated was she said, said, you know, grief is the price we pay for love. And I thought that was such a beautiful quote. And then I found out she was actually talking about her dogs. <laughs> just, yes. You know, um, and then just another one is the upward course of a nation's history is due in the long run to the soundness of heart and mind of its average men and women. So Julie Montague, uh, your life has changed because you live in England. We are watching it. And it's been such a pleasure speaking to a Viscountess who has had to learn all about British nobility and royalty. And is there anything else that surprised you? How long have you been married now? So for over 20 years, yeah. So you and are now fully, are you accepted is the question. I, luckily for me, I have always been accepted. You know, I married into just an absolutely extraordinary family um, who accepted me for who I am. And, and by the way, can I just say that, you know, since I've been married now for um, about 20 years, you know, I've never missed a Thanksgiving. And I can tell you, one of the things that my in-laws, the Earl and Countess of Sandwich, love every year is coming to Thanksgiving. And they asked me- Thanksgiving. Yeah, yeah, I do Thanksgiving. And even this year they said, please tell us you're having another Thanksgiving. And I said, absolutely. And, you know, and so they've really embraced, uh, you know, the American in me. And of course their grandchildren are half American and they they want to support that and bring, make sure that they remember 
you know, their mother's roots, me. And of course they have the English side to them as well, but it's, it's wonderful for me to be able to raise four children in England, but remind them, hey, we've got 4th of July. Hey, we've got uh, Thanksgiving. And these are the things that you must continue to do when you have children, uh, if and when you have children yourself. So my in-laws have been absolutely extraordinary. The one things that we probably disagree on is the sandwich. And let me tell you why. I'm afraid I'm a, ve- I'm, I'm a vegetarian. So um, the, the fourth Earl of Sandwich, you know, the sandwich that he had, which is what became uh, the sandwich as we know it worldwide was a piece of roast beef um, put in between uh, two pieces of bread. And my father-in-law, it is still his favorite sandwich, but unfortunately for me, the vegetarian, it's not so much. I think I prefer almost an Italian sandwich with uh, mozzarella, tomato, and basil, but he's fine with that. Sandwich. Now, if people want to see Mepperton or hear more about the estates that you talk about, so they go on to mepperton.com. Yes. And if they want to Google you, it's the American Viscountess. Yes. And I will, I will also just mention here, Nadia, we have a huge YouTube channel. So if you just search Mapperton which is over 100,000 um, subscribers. We're the only historic house in all of the UK documenting how hard it is to run a historic house, the ups and the downs. Every Saturday we have an episode going out. And then my American Viscountess YouTube channel has over 100,000 subscribers. And I visit historic houses, other historic houses across the UK. So if you are a real Anglophile, oh. They go and so come and watch us. And what's so extraordinary about these buildings is they are so beautifully built, right? Just the, the, the construction without modern architecture, it never ceases to amaze me just how remarkable the building is and the construction. Right. It's. I mean, it's extraordinary because we think about these buildings being built in the Tudor period or the Elizabethan or even Jacobean period and the carvings and the fabric of these buildings, both outside and inside, you know, the interiors are Robert Adam design. It, it, you know, when you fi- see those houses, it's extraordinary to see them. And I'm lucky enough to be able to actually visit them and stay in the houses. So every time I visit a house, the homeowners allow me to stay in one of the, you know, one of these absolutely astounding, um, astonishing bedrooms. Because it is, I mean, don't you think Downton Abbey did so much for helping us get an idea of these beautiful historic houses? And of course, now there's Bridgerton and all of these beautiful, beautiful period pieces that showcase these things so magnificently. But I will say, Julie, whatever your thoughts are around the Queen or monarchy or imperialism, the pomp and ceremony, nobody does it like the British. No, isn't it? It's, I mean, it is, Nadia. I mean, what we have seen so far, it's absolutely extraordinary and it's done with precision that it's just the the beauty in it all is that it is the ceremony and the precision around it is you will never find that anywhere else in the world what can we expect uh, in terms of the funeral you know the the in terms of funeral again it's going to be again a very very somber moment not just here in the uk but across the globe uh, we will see, you know, dignitaries coming in. I think it's 2,200 people are heading to Westminster Abbey. And we will see, I mean, it'll be interesting to see that guest list. We know that President Joe Biden is, of course, coming um, to see all the people coming to give and pay their respects to the Queen, to mourn her. But I think on the other hand, to celebrate her, the 70-year reign, 96 years old, and her ability ability to unite as i said earlier and to heal you know broken a broken country and even at times a broken world and i hope that some of these dignitaries that are coming in will be able to take a page out of her book and instead of you know wanting to make sure that they get the enough votes and perhaps they're not speaking from their heart. Maybe they will think twice and think, you know what, I'm just going to be me speak from my heart and uh, be there to, to unify the people just like the queen did. The Viscountess of Henchingbrook 
um, I hope I'm saying it correctly, Julie Montague. It has been such a pleasure just getting some insight into the royals, into Queen Elizabeth, and just thank you for sharing some of the lessons, the life and leadership lessons from Queen Elizabeth II. Julie Montague, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me, Nadia.